the book of Acts chapter 17. And I haven't decided what verse we're going to start in yet, so just find Acts 17. I can tell you to be in the 20s, so we'll get to Acts chapter 17 here in just a minute. I got to thinking this week, I thought back throughout my own life about how God has been so good to me, and it done me good to reminisce about earlier times in my life and family that was that was with me then that have went on to heaven now and, and how things were and, and being around some of my friends when we were in school and growing up and getting ever uh, getting every once in a while I get to see my old buddies from Dover even though they'd wear shirts that said Carnation uh, when ours said Appleton but uh, we'd get to meet and play a little baseball and have some fun and just thinking back to just how amazing God is, how he protects us and he guides us. And thinking back about all the things we've seen on our journey, and I want you to know tonight a journey is an act of traveling from one place to another. When we're born, we start our journey, and we're on a destination. Now, a lot of us think today about a journey being a, uh, a vacation or a trip we might take, you know, uh, Rick and Earl went up into Amish country and they took a journey but I want you to realize there's a more important journey that we're on and I think we take it for granted and I think we take each other for granted on that journey because if you'll take just a few moments tonight and reflect on your life back to when you were a child as you grew up and you know, there's some loved ones that was in your life back then that have, have went on like me and and just how quickly that journey is, seems to be taking place. And uh, what I want you to know tonight is that journey began the day we were born. Some of us was born in the 60s, uh, some in the 70s, and some in the 30s, and some in the 40s and 50s. You know, we're spread out in here. And some even had waited to the 2000s to be born. And, but our journey begins. And, you know, every one of us, some of us, while we're on that journey, sometimes the road gets rough. Sometimes it's smooth. Sometimes it's uphill. Sometimes it's downhill. And sometimes it's straight and level. Some journeys are much shorter than others. You know, I can't tell you tonight when your journey will end here. If... Uh, if Jesus delays the rapture of the church, every one of our journeys will end. And, I, you know, I think there's a reason why we don't know the day our journey is going to end because I believe it would make us, it would, it, it would hinder our faith. Some of us have family whose journeys was not long enough, in our opinion. But one thing is for sure, your journey and my journey will come to an end. And when it does... That journey will end in one of two destinations. I believe we're going to go through some things tonight, and I believe when we start, I believe you'll see this is in steps. I believe most of us tonight, under the sound of my voice, probably feel secure in your destination of heaven. I hope so. I hope we all do. But if you're here tonight and you don't feel secure in your destination of heaven, you're going to get another opportunity to make that destination a reality. But while our journeys may be very similar, in some ways they'll be different. But I want you to know that the journey that you've lived up to now has been designed, and I'm going to take you in Scripture and show you, been designed to draw you to God. Now, anybody in here on your destination ever made a bad decision, ever made the road rougher than it needed to be? Well, guess what? That, too... Our consequences from that is designed to draw us closer to God. Me and Sister Diane was talking before church about basically rock bottom. You know, if it takes rock bottom for our loved ones to find God, then folks, you need to pray for rock bottom. And, uh, and we actually found rock bottom on the Internet the other day. It was a stone that goes in the garden, and it looked like a bottom. So, uh, 
a human bottom, by the way, so rock bottom. Uh, if you need to know where rock bottom is, it's on, on for sale on the internet. But you know, we don't we don't enjoy seeing our loved ones struggle on a journey. We don't we don't enjoy seeing our children or our loved ones or anybody suffer. But folks, the Bible tells us that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. So if we will change the way we look at that, folks, hey, if it takes, I don't care if it takes a heart attack, cancer, diabetes, if it leads them to God, they win. Amen? This is, our journey here is a short journey. It is a temporary journey. The Bible says it is but a vapor. Folks, I, have you ever just sat around and told yourself how old you are? I found myself doing that this week. And somebody asked me, and I, I promise you, and Sister Frankie knows how good my memory is, I couldn't remember how old I was. I could get it down to two years, but I had to sit there and remember. I can, I can remember the year I was born, okay? I got that. So then I can add and subtract, so I figured it out. I'm 54. But I thought I was 53. I was convinced myself. So I, was, I thought, well, you know what? I'll just shoot for 35. Because, you know, they say you are what you think. <laughs> well, that didn't work, folks. I, my bones were still creaking and my back still hurt. But on this journey, we've got to remember what our destination is. And like I told you before, I, I pray tonight that you know that the end of your journey is home. And that's heaven. There's only two options. You're either going to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Now, knowing that you're going to heaven, doesn't that make this journey a little easier to take? Doesn't it make the troubles that come our way a little easier to bear? But what about the ones traveling on the wrong road? What about the ones we love or the ones we care about or, or even the ones we don't know yet that are on the wrong road? So I want to show you how this is going to build. But if you will, I want to show you in Scripture how that everything is designed to draw us to God. So if you would, turn to Acts chapter 17. And I believe I'm going to start in verse 24. Acts 17 and 24. And when you find that tonight, if you would, stand to honor the re reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation." They should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to be in this house. Lord, we thank you for just loving us, forgiving us, and being patient with us. We thank you tonight for the beautiful songs and the testimonies, Lord. If we were honest, Lord, we could thank you from now till the day our breath leaves this body. Lord, but now it comes to preaching of your word. And again tonight, I would ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins and cleanse this vessel with your holy blood. And I just pray tonight, Lord, that the words that come from this vessel be your words. The thoughts in this vessel be your thoughts. And Lord, I just pray that you plant it in our hearts, Lord, and help us grow in you tonight so that we can be what you want us to be. And in Jesus' precious holy name, as children prayed. Amen. These last two verses is what really grabbed me, 26 and 27. God has made all nations one blood. For to dwell on this earth, he determines the times and the bounds of our habitation. He is in control. And, how, and why has he set this all up this way? That we should seek him. If we might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Have you ever been in your, on your journey and felt like God was a million miles away at some point in your life? 
when your heart was just crushed or broke and you didn't know why maybe it was a struggle or a trial you were going through and you thought God wasn't listening to you or maybe you just didn't think God was there folks can I tell you something he's there and he's listening the only thing that keeps God from hearing us is unconfessed sin in our lives but folks if we if we confess that sin I promise you tonight God hears you God's concerned about your life whatever's going on right now in your life and folks I look around this room and I know every one of us have different things going on in our life every one of us have different family issues every one of us has and now sometimes it's similar but sometimes it, it can be it can be very different or, or it can be similar but how we view those things really relates to our walk with Christ the closer we are with Christ the less we are to be anxious or to worry about those things. But I want you to know tonight, we've read in Scripture, God controls the times and he controls the bounds. You know, and, and I, I equate that with the other Scripture where he, you know, he's the one that told the ocean you can only go so far. Folks, if he has that kind of power, <laughs> what in your life can he not control? I'm going to be honest with you. There's been some issues in my heart lately that I've been praying about that's kind of eating away at me. And, and I, I've talked to some of you, and I know the same kind of situation where we see people who we know are traveling on the wrong road. It scares us, and you wonder why they won't listen to God, why they won't turn to God. Folks, I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is God determines the times and he and sets the bounds of their habitation. In other words, God is in control. And our God is a loving God, amen? He's a patient God, amen? He knows his ways, as Isaiah tells us, his ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. So what he calls us to do is to pray fervently. And I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but to me, I think this is one of the most important points. A Christian, and I don't throw that label around lightly, a true Christian, a true child of God will be heartbroken for this world, amen? They will look around and see the filth and the trash. If it don't bother you, friend, you probably need to find somewhere to pray and talk to God. You might want to check that salvation because, folks, what God did for me, I can never repay. But because of what he did for me, I want him to do that for others. And he he draws no lines. He'll do it for anybody if they will just seek him. And this last, did you catch this last line? Though he be not far from every one of us. It's not God that creates distance. It is us that creates distance. We are the ones that walk away from God. God is steady. God is continual. If you feel like you're not hearing God anymore, or if you feel like you don't feel the power of God in your life anymore, let me tell you who to check. Check in the mirror, because it's us. And folks, I have learned this from experience. When I go into my room and I begin to study, the other day I asked myself, I said, you know, God, I want it to come as powerful as it used to. I want the hairs to stand up on the back of my neck. Folks, I know you may not believe me, and I don't care. It's between me and God. There has been times when he was giving me the sermon that I promise you there's other people in the room with me. I could feel them, and I could see them move out of the corner of my eyes, and I knew it was angels that God had sent, and I knew that God was speaking to my heart. He was doing it to let me know, and I had been missing and that and I said God why don't you speak to me like that anymore and then it come to me I wasn't in there enough I wasn't in there long enough I wasn't asking him enough I didn't care you understand God was still there God still wanted to touch me he still wanted to speak to my heart but it was me that had drifted not him and I encourage you tonight if you feel like I felt folks it's you that have drifted not him he's there He's just waiting on us to come see him. 
One of my daughters, I won't tell you which one, I won't call her name, but she's the youngest one, <clears throat> wants us to stuff her when she passes <laughs> and have her get a taxidermist so she can hang around. And I said, well, you know what? She would probably talk to me more if she was stuffed in the other room. <laughs> she would always be there with me. But do you believe in God tonight? And, 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 don't give me a half answer. Do you truly believe in God? Do you believe God is alive? Do you believe he's here with us tonight? Do you believe he's with you alone when you're alone at your house? Folks, God is real, and he's with us. And like the sister testified, if we will ask him for the wisdom, folks, he'll direct us. But we've got to want it. We got to, and we've got to give him the time. Amen? I, I think too many times we want to be part-time children and enjoy a full-time father. And thank God he puts up with us, and he's patient. But he wants full-time children. So the most important thing we're to learn on our journey is that we need Jesus, not things. You know, the older I get, the more I realize, why do we accum accumulate things? Uh, what are we going to do with them? I mean, my son-in-law... He likes to bless me with stuff that they don't use anymore, so we're stored at our house. <laughs> I'm going to pay him back. I'm going to get him that gift that gives all year long, like the Jelly of the Month Club. But <laughs> why do we accumulate things? Think about it. What are we storing them up for? I mean, the best thing I, I can think of is I can store up as much as I can, so when I leave this walk of earth, this walk of life, I've got two girls going to have to dig through it all. And I can holler Merry Christmas from, from heaven. But, but think about our journey. How many of our journeys are focused on obtaining something that's temporary? I'd say probably 90% or greater of our journeys are focused on things. Look around this room. That's what our journey ought to be focused on other than God, each other, people, time. You know, and I heard it again this week, and it's so true. I heard this gentleman, he, he, he was diagnosed, and he, and he was passing away, and he was leaving, you know, messages for his family. He said, not one time, friend, when you come to the end, will you wish you have made more money? Will you wish you made more, uh, bought more things? He said, you'll wish you had more time with those you loved. Folks, this journey is short. I'm here to tell you tonight, if there's people you have a riff with, get over it. Be, big, be the bigger person, be the Christian, go to them and make it right. This life is too short. And not only that, the Bible is clear. If we do not forgive, we are not forgiven. There's nothing in this world worth us, A, either not going to heaven, or B, living a miserable life. I know some people have done you wrong, they've done me wrong. People do people wrong. And people do unimaginable things to other people. But if my God can forgive us for what we did to him, there is nothing we can't forgive others for what they did to us. So now... We've learned that we need Jesus, not things. We must realize that we are sinners, and Jesus is the only way to forgiveness. And I told you this would kind of go in steps tonight, and I hope everyone in here has accepted this first step, that you've realized you're a sinner and you need Jesus, and you've invited him in and you're saved. Okay, step one. Step two, once you're a born-again child of God, you know what you must do? And... Again, I'm going to go back to a study that I'm going to quote over and over and over that Dr. David Jeremiah and them conducted and said that 6% of confessing Christians in the United States of America read their Bible daily. 6%. Folks, that is unacceptable. There's no way. There's countries that they would kill to get their hands on a Bible. In this country, I guarantee you, if I went to any of your house, we got six or eight of them lying around. 
We are so spoiled that we forgot the treasure that we have in our home. Folks, there's couples going through divorce where the answer is in a bookshelf covered in dust. There's people trying to raise their kids and, and battle and keep them off drug addiction and keep them out of the evil world, and the answer's on their shelf covered in dust. There's people who have financial troubles, health problems, they don't know what to do, and the answer is on the shelf covered in dust. Folks, the answer to your life's problems is in this book. And if you'll put your nose in it and read it, it is far more beneficial to you than anything you'll see on the news or you'll see in Facebook. The answer is between the covers. Now, this book tells us, we've been, all right, you say, all right, Pastor, I'm saved. What's next? Seek him daily. Not weekly, not monthly. I'll even go above that. Seek him hourly, minute. Folks, how many of you just catch yourself talking to God throughout the day? Amen? Well, listen to what the Bible says about in 1 Chronicles 16, 11. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Did that say every now and then? Anybody want to tell me what continually means? All the time. Not part of the time, all the time. So we've been saved. Now we know that we're to seek him continually. Why? Why are we to seek him continually? Why is it imperative that we seek God? Because there's coming a day when you will not be able to seek God. You will not be able to find him. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Remember what we just read in Acts? He be not far from every one of us. Isaiah says, call upon him while he is near. That tells me there is coming a day when he will not be near. And he will not hear our cry. Folks, this is something that hurts my heart. For these people that we do pray about and that we're seeking, especially these young kids who think they've got all their life ahead of them, and they're living in this dark, dark place. Everybody must know that there is a last opportunity to give your heart and soul to God. And it may not even be the day you die. If you turn from God enough, if you reject God enough, that can be it. The Holy Spirit will only knock. So many times. And it frightens me to know that people will turn away from that knock. So after we find Jesus and we're seeking him daily, folks, I'm going to tell you, if God is your, if he's your savior and you start seeking him daily, let me step out here on a limb and tell you, you will enjoy the blessings of life. Amen. I promise you, you will have a blessed life and I will stand on the authority of the word of God telling you right now that if you'll seek God daily, you will live a blessed life. You will enjoy his blessings and your life will be blessed. Well, let me ask you then, are we finished at that point? You have found God, he's your savior, and now you're seeking him daily. Husbands and wives, read together. Husbands and wives, pray together. Do whatever it is to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you and your life will be blessed. But here at the end of the day, here's my question. Are you done at that point? Absolutely not. What are you to do once you've reached that point? Reach back and help somebody else find who you have found. Help them find God. I was so inspired by a young man I talked to. He goes to this church, and he's, he's in school, and he's, he's going to travel around, and he's got a job where he's going to do a lot of traveling, and he's in a job that's going to make quite a bit of money. And the first thing he told me wasn't about money. The first words out of his mouth was, his, he said, I'm going to get to travel and witness to a whole lot of people. Folks, that's, that is why we're here. You know, I've told you this before, but I heard it at that men's conference at Tech that time. If you go to work tomorrow, 
Don't go to work to do your job. Go to work to serve God and do your job while you're there. If you go to the grocery store, don't go to buy groceries. Go there to serve God, get groceries while you're there. If we would view our lives like that, folks, it would change. I think on this journey, the older we get, I do believe the wiser we get. And we look back and we see things that we should have done or maybe could have done. But these last two verses I'm going to share with you before we close. And, and, and he's brought us to these scriptures quite a bit in the last couple months. I believe he's telling us that, it, okay, you're good. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're saved, and you're seeking God continually. You say, is there more? Yes, there is. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I see far too many violating this whole verse. I see churches violating it. I see pastors violating it. Let nothing be done through strife, okay? Or vain glory. What is vain glory? Who are you looking to glorify if you're involved in vain glory? Raise your hand. I wish from the bottom of my heart Facebook had never been invented because it entices pastors to toot their own horn. It entices churches to blow their own horn. Folks, the Bible is clear. When we help others, we're to shut our mouth. It does tell us to let our light shine, but does that mean to advertise? <laughs> no, that means to do good works. The minute our flesh, as we learned this morning, the minute the flesh comes in, you, you get vain glory. Folks, I'm going to tell you, God deserves all the glory. Not some of it, not most of it, all of it. But the last part of this, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Is that what the world teaches at all? Put others above you. And I wanted... And I thought about what Sister Frankie said this morning about the parking with the tag, folks. How many people would abuse that in this world? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Do you remember a time in your life when people were more neighborly than they are now? When people genuinely cared about the people down the road? This last verse I want to share with you. I had something... I heard something this week, and this, re this really struck home. Galatians 6, 2. Now, I'm talking tonight to a church that's saved. I'm talking to a person who's saved, and they're seeking God continually. You're blessed. Your home is blessed. Listen to Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Can I read that the way most people interpret that today? Go to church and drive by, do not look, and you will not feel guilty. That's exactly how they read it. If I don't know, I'm not responsible. What can I do anyway? It's like somebody... You've ever heard the term, and I know all you teachers have heard, mandated reporter. Can I tell you something? If you're a Christian tonight, you're a mandated prayer warrior. If you're a Christian, you're a mandated carer. But I see people claim the tag of Christianity and look at destruction in a child and not care. 
Let me be brutally honest with you. That is not a child of God. They need to meet Jesus Christ and they need to be saved themselves. Because if you are a child of God, you will care. It will break your heart for the way some people live in this world and the way some people are treated. Folks, we live in a fallen world. Amen? It's not going to be heaven down here. And I, I forget who said it, but I know me and Jen heard it somewhere this week. If you're a Christian, this is the worst hell you'll ever see. We need to praise God for that. But folks, there's people living around each and every one of us in hell. You know, I commend you teachers and you people that work with the kids. How you keep your sanity, it has to be a gift from God. Because I'm afraid I'd have to go to some of their houses and and lose it on some parents because it bothers me tremendously because we all know kids are cruel and the kids don't take into account how they're raised or what they live in at home they don't and you know I, I went to some houses and I, I don't even know if I don't remember if Michael Joe was with, with us or not but I remember going to one in Dover and it was awful horrible the conditions and you're like how can you expect these kids to live in this condition and then still function properly at school because you know what they're thinking about when they show up to school they're not thinking about algebra they're not thinking about english they're not thinking about the test that's coming up this week. They're not worried about the ACT. They're not worried about the standardized testing. They're wondering, am I going to get enough to eat for lunch because I know when I go home I'm not going to have anything. Folks, that should not exist around Christians, amen? We should step in and we should take control and we should take charge. And folks, we can if we will get up and if we'll pray for the wisdom and the discernment and, and we ask God to put us in places where we need to be, folks, we can make a difference in this world. And now, while they go home and learn something different they can learn from us that there is a better way there is a higher way there is a father in heaven that loves them their earthly father and their earthly mother may not be much to them at this time but they can learn that they are loved that they are a precious gift from God that, that, that somebody died for them on a cross and folks it breaks my heart to see these people if we're not hurt for them then we need to check ourselves there's something wrong with us on our journey when we find Christ and we seek him daily basically this is, this is what he wants us to know tonight if that's where you're at and I pray it is I, I pray if you're under the sound of my voice tonight I pray you're saved if you're not saved, none of this applies to you. You've got to find Jesus Christ. You've got to turn it over to him. And like we learned this morning, you have to sacrifice your flesh. Let's just say that we're all there. But if you're not, there's going to be an altar call in a minute. You get it right with God because today could be your last day. But you've got that right. I don't know your reading habits. I don't know what you do at home. But, folks, I'm here to tell you because I love you. If you're not reading your Bible daily and asking God for wisdom and discernment in your Bible, folks, you are failing. You need to seek him continually. Talk to him throughout the day. He wants to hear from you. So get saved. Seek him continually. If that's where you're at, praise God because you're blessed. But listen, your work is not done. As long as you're alive, I want you to know, as long as you're breathing, you're not done. Amen? As long as you're breathing, you have a work to do, and that work is to reach back and help somebody else meet Jesus the way you did. Amen? If you would, stand with me all over this building. Dear, and I'd ask you tonight to bow your heads and close your eyes. Just, this is a very, very personal time between you and God I want to know tonight as your pastor are you comfortable tonight with your salvation 
Have you given your heart and soul to Jesus Christ? Friend, if you haven't, the angels will rejoice if you will just step forward and come and give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. After that, everything else, folks, it's just like a load is lifted off. God died for you, and all he asks is that you live for him. Tonight, are you 100% sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If you are, praise God for that. It is a gift from God. Nothing you could do, but it, it, you couldn't work and earn it, but he give it to you. Now, are you seeking him daily? That's something you're going to have to decide tonight. What are you going to seek tomorrow when you wake up? Are you going to seek this world or are you going to seek God? Do you need to crack that Bible open? Are you reading it every day? Friend, if you're not, I cannot encourage you enough to start tomorrow. Start tonight. Open your Bible and read his word. It, does your heart break for the lost and the abused? If it doesn't, friend, you need to speak to Jesus tonight. If you have anything tonight in your life that you want to pray about, my Bible tells me that if we'll pray together, that moves the hand of God. If you got something that's troubling your heart, something in your life, if you need encouragement, if you need strength tonight, God wants to do that for you. God wants to.